Peter Hazel is project coordinator at the highly regarded research, education and advocacy organisation, the Maloon Institute. He manages a catchment scale landscape rehydration project on the southern tablelands of New South Wales. He's an expert in landscape rehydration with 15 years experience in the public and private sector. His experience as a remote sensing specialist, a water scientist and an Australian government NRM facilitator. He put his region ag ex expertise into action through rehabilitating his 374 hectare farm with his family. The Maloon Community Landscape Rehydration Project demonstrates landscape rehydration and regeneration at the catchment scale. The project aims to rebuild the natural landscape function of the entire Maloon catchment and boost its resilience to climatic extremes, leading to more reliable stream flows, improved ecosystem functioning and enhanced productivity. The Institute, and this is the really powerful bit for me, and, I, and we'll hear some about it, the Maloon Institute, Maloon Institute has successfully engaged multiple stakeholders, as you would, across such a catchment scale, to deliver a project including 20 landholders across 23,000 hectares and 50 kilometres of creeks. To tell us about it, please give a warm hand to Peter, Peter Hazel. state time. Okay. Um, all right, I'd first, um, I'd first like to pay my respects to the um, Wajap Yuna people um, on whose land uh, we're meeting today. Um, <coughs> I was on my way to the airport yesterday, uh, driving into the Canberra airport, and I um, stopped behind a removalist van and emblazoned on the tailgate of that removalist van was a quote um, it said dead fish a dead fish always swims with the flow now I've no idea what that's got to do with removal furniture removal <laughs> but I found it actually a very profound quote because in fact that's exactly what life does, is that it swims against the flow, uh, quite literally and figuratively as well. So life itself, if you think about flowing water, um, resists the flow of water and the more that life breaks down, the faster that water flows and um, the more erosive that flow becomes. But also water is the ultimate conveyor on planet Earth um, of energy. It's a conveyor of energy and it's a transformer of energy as well. And so water by itself has the power to erode landscapes to the sea. It is only when coupled with the biodiversity of the planet that land landscapes are able to start to rebuild. And so life itself on this planet is basically an outpost uh, in a universe of immense and enormous power. If you think about the amount of energy that reaches planet Earth every day, it's 10,000 times the amount of energy that is used by all of humanity. 180 billion nuclear power stations worth of energy is pumped out of the sun on a daily basis of which only 0.1% of that is captured through photosynthesis and then thread for, uh, fed through all of the life systems to keep the, the life systems functioning. That other 99.9% .9 has to be managed on a daily basis and then um, essentially find its way back out into the universe. And it is through that relationship between the, the water cycle and the, the planet's biodiversity, especially its plant systems that have a primary role to play in that. 
And so it's those sorts of fundamentals that really underpin the work that we're doing at Maloon Creek. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that a little bit later on. Um, as Anthony said, I'm the coordinator of the Maloon Community Landscape Rehydration Project. Um, uh, sorry, how do I move forward on this? Oh, beg your pardon? The big green one. Okay, I didn't get a chance to practice. It's on the southern tablelands of, of New South Wales. Um, it's just east of Canberra and, and on the way to the coast. As Anthony said, it's a, a, a research project that's trying to understand the, the um, um, natural function and rebuilding of that function of that landscape. It's triple bottom line. It's biophysical, social and uh, an economic research project. And so, rather than just putting up photographs comparing, as many other region agriculturalists do, um, the landholder on the other side of the fence, uh, we've decided to bring the landholder on the other side of the fence onto our side of the fence. So, so we're all in the tent uh, together. And so, we're essentially bringing the community along, not just the landholders within the catchment itself, but the broader community as well. Um, beyond the catchment, and that includes lots of other farmers, landholders, school groups, government organisations, um, politicians, and even the corporate sector um, are coming along on this journey. Now, the two central characters in this project are Peter Andrews and the late Tony Coote. Uh, Peter Andrews has been described as an irascible genius. Uh, Tony Coote, the late Tony Coote is a jeweller, a farmer, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. He set up the Maloon Institute and bequeathed both of his farms, very profitable farms, to the Maloon Institute uh, so that they couldn't be sold and that the, the, the research that the Institute and the education that it undertakes can be undertaken in, into perpetuity. Um, so he's got a vision of this occurring for the next several hundred years at least. Now, I first met, Tony and Peter met each other in 2005. I met Peter in 2004, before he became famous. He was living with Jerry Harvey at the time in pretty rough conditions. Now, I wasn't immediately inspired by Peter. I met him on his property at uh, Tarwin Park. It wasn't for a few months when I met Peter again and he was uh, surrounded by a, a few scientists. Um, John Williams from CSIRO Land and Water Australia, uh, the, the head of, of Land and Water at the time, and a couple of European scientists, uh, uh, water scientists, Willie Ripple and Jan Pakorny. And it was what they started to talk about which really started to inspire me and help me understand the depth of what uh, Peter was, in a practical sense, uh, achieving, had achieved at Tarwin Park and trying to communicate um, in his travels around the country. Um, bearing in mind by that point, um, and when I met Peter, I was working with the federal government, uh, and at that point, Peter had been bothering all levels of government for about 20 years to that point um, and still hadn't made a lot of progress uh, in terms of, of um, you know, getting his ideas across. And so, but Jan and Willie were really interesting characters. They were interested in thermodynamics, energy flow and transformation. Willie and Jan felt that the critical relationship between the water cycle and the planet's plant systems was and always will be the key to managing and dissipating the constant onslaught of solar and gravitational energy. It's not just solar energy, it's gravitational energy as well. That's what causes the erosive forces um, that would otherwise cook, freeze, wash, or blow us all away. So we are, we're dealing with colossal universal forces here. Uh, and as we break our life systems down, more so, those universal forces are gonna come, come knocking, and they are coming knocking. And so the more we rebuild our landscapes, which are biologically built landscapes, 
um, have been building and rebuilding for three and a half billion years now and it's been a co-evolution of life that we now reach the pinnacle of only only in the Holocene period which is the last twelve and a half thousand years have the conditions the climatic conditions actually been as far as we can tell as relatively stable as they have been as we you know us colonists of, of Australia have come to enjoy but you know we can uh, they're, they're in, a, in a sense the exception rather than the norm the, the last 12,000 years worth of, of pretty decent climatic conditions so both Willie and Jan were arguing that increasing atmospheric co2 was only a part of the equation is only a part of the equation it's certainly an important part of the equation you know that creates the blanket if you like that holds you know a bit more of this energy in um, when it comes to climate change but they suggested that the disruption of the global water cycle the planet's primary thermoregulation system could have manifoldly more serious consequences for us and we could be experiencing that today with the, the drought the, the dryness and the wildfires that are going on in you know right at the end of winter on the east coast of of Australia at the moment so Willie said that the, fun the functioning ecosystems short circuit the water cycle Let me bring up another slide the functioning ecosystems short circuit the water slot cycle they slow liquid water down they cause water at a great they cause a greater quantity of water to phase change to go through the, the liquid gas solid phase and in so doing absorb and release energy and to cycle more rapidly on a diurnal basis and in so doing dissipate energy which builds our landscapes and builds fertility so this has been in my opinion the primary role of the planet's biodiversity um, life systems has been to dissipate this massive onslaught of energy um, over over time so Willie argued that the green leaf surface area of the continents in other words the evaporative surface area of the continents prior to the industrial revolution was greater than that of the oceans this kept the continents cooler and therefore attracted more rain in off the ocean destruction of ecosystems across all of the continents in the last 250 years has heated the continents up relative to the oceans causing more of our precious land-based evaporation to drift out over the oceans where it condenses into rain because it's cooler. How often do we see the weather radars that show the rain falling just off the coast and, and uh, not in on the land? And so if you look at this schematic here, oops, um, which one goes back? <laughs> Sorry, I'm hopeless, aren't I? It's the red bit. Oh, that's all right. Um, You've got most of the water, most of the, the global evaporation comes off the ocean, obviously, 85%. Um, but most of that falls straight back into the ocean, a good 75% of the, the global water. Only 10% of the amount of water that flows, that, that evaporates off the ocean, comes into the land and falls as rain. The balance. balance has got to come from land-based evaporation evapotranspiration and this is partly what the scientists call the daily water cycle the short water cycle the diurnal cycling of water um, on, a, on a daily basis evaporation evapotranspiration and condensation and so these are the these are the processes that we're that we're losing across the whole of the continent now Jan Picorni So, yeah, on the other hand, as ecosystem function starts to break down, the water cycle lengthens, more energy is concentrated, and this is what causes erosion and loss of fertility. So the destruction of ecosystems... But, um, so Jan Bacorny talked about the difference in energy conversion between a dry and a hydrated landscape. On an average day, a thousand watts per square meter um, will reach the surface of the planet that's a gigawatt per square kilometer 
if that's a dry surface, then that energy is going to be converted mainly to heat, sensible heat, which is heat you can feel. If it's a hydrated or a, or a green surface, most of that energy is going to be converted to latent heat, which defined is for every unit of energy that is absorbed in evaporation, in evaporated water, there is no increase in temperature. It's your classic evaporative air conditioner effect. And so you've got a major difference in the conversion of energy between a dry landscape and a hydrated landscape. And then with that energy that's captured within evapotranspiration, that's often taken up into the higher atmosphere where the water condenses and releases that energy again. Five minutes ago, there was this. Mine goes quick, doesn't it? Okay, so this is basically the fundamentals that have been underpinning the catchment scale work that we're doing at Maloon. And so I'm just going to quickly go through a bunch of slides now because I've only got five minutes to go. Um, <laughs> I spend a bit long talking about these fundamentals often. Um, but if you want to hear more about them, I'm actually running a, work, a couple of workshops uh, down in southwest Western Australia at the end of the week. Um, the second one, you might be able to talk about that, Anthony. Um, still isn't fully booked yet where we can go into a fuller description. But you can see in the patterns and processes of the landscape um, how these, uh, you know, these energy dissipating features play out uh, and conversely when they start to break down how they play out and they're fairly obvious. Like on the southern tablelands, this is an intact chain of ponds system, for example, where the system is able to hold onto water and you've got these uh, full ponds, essentially, where, uh, you know, even in the driest times, they're just windows on the groundwater. Uh, and so where you see the, the pond there, uh, you know, that will be a fully hydrated floodplain right across to the, to the edge of the floodplain. And this, uh, this is the property that, uh, that my wife and I uh, run here, the 360 hectare property, which has got a, a, a three kilometre chain of ponds system running through it. And, uh, and we monitor that system. And even today, in the driest winter that we've had in 130 years, these ponds are still banked full. And, uh, and the floodplain, it's about 40 hectares worth of floodplain is green from one side to the other. This here is a, a slightly bigger intact chain of ponds uh, wetland system, um, valley floor system called Barambali Swamp. It's about 100 hectares. And you can see these are full ponds here. This is an infrared image taken a few years ago on the middle of the hottest, driest January on record. And uh, where it's red is basically green. And so, you know, this is the middle of the hottest month of the year and you've got 100 hectares of, of actively growing green vegetation and a fully hydrated floodplain, um, which is cooler during the daytime at, when you get 40 and 45 degree heat, and it's warmer at night, and it's cycling that water. You'll uh, wake up the next morning, and this will have um, thick dew on, on the leaves, and there will be mists in the valley. And so this is just the process of the breaking down of these floodplain systems. You can see it starts off as, a, uh, as an intact, um, low energy, slow moving system. And then uh, European animals are introduced and they eat the vegetation. The water starts to move more quickly. It starts to incise. It starts to become dehydrated. And, uh, and you end up with that situation. Um, deep gullies everywhere. Uh, I understand there's a million kilometers of these sorts of gully systems right throughout the country. Uh, you get a, a storm event go through and uh, you get a rapid pulse of water and then it's dry immediately afterwards. This is just another schematic showing an incised system. A pulse goes through, it's gone instantly almost, within half an hour and then you're back to dry conditions again. On the other hand, an intact system, these these events that go through, they're just recharging events and most of that water will go straight over the top, essentially. The system's already, already green and, uh, and vibrant and, uh, and much of that water will, will continue down the system and just, just tops up the already hydrated system itself. Um, 
this is a, a flow duration curve. Uh, I can't really sort of spend. Have I got? I may as well soak up question time. So, <laughs> I always tend to go a bit long. Um, yeah, flow duration curve. So, a storm water drain is your flow duration curve on on your left, uh, and you've got an intact valley floor system is your flow duration curve on the right. So it's that energy pulse goes through on the left, very high, very hard, very quick. Um, but if you've got an intact system or a rebuilt system, then that pulse is a lot lower and the tail's a lot longer. And so, and so there's the same amount of energy going through the system, but it's just um, spread out over a, a longer period of time and a greater area. Um, and then there's water uh, left in the system which is able to trickle out uh, during the dry times. And so back in 2005 when Tony and Peter Andrews got together they decided they wanted to work together on, on Tony Coote's uh, home farm and so he started to uh, put structures into this uh, valley floor, this 100 hectare floodplain on Maloon Creek Natural Farms. Uh, you can see here that you've got a, an erosion gully effectively running straight down through the middle of it. This in the past would not have had that gully running through it. It would have been a discontinuous chain of pond systems. Now it's a deeply eroded gully up to 10 metres deep. And this would have been a valley floor which would have held on to, um, which would have had banked about 3,000 megalitres, about 3 gigalitres about three Optus stadiums worth of water, um, which would have trickled out over the dry times. But in pulling the plug out of this floodplain, uh, it, was, it was now dry back in, in 2006. So Peter went about just effectively putting structures into the creek and, uh, and stepping, the, stepping the system back up and bringing that water level back up again. And so now that system, and it's only a small part of the system, um, has constant flow flowing out of the, the bottom of the floodplain. Uh, there's an increase in stock carrying capacity on that floodplain by about 60%. It has a great, great resilience to drought and floods. So we had a, uh, uh, a one in 50 year flood event go through the system in 2016 and it just was a re rejuvenating event for it. Uh, whereas further downstream it was, it was quite destructive. Um, we've got moderated microclimate and uh, dramatically increased biodiversity. Uh, this is the scene before the work started down at Peter's Pond, which is named after Peter Andrews, not me, um, 2006 and, and now in 2015. This system has improved from an ecological perspective so much that the once dominant um, mosquito fish, which is an introduced fish, used to be um, right through this part of the system. But on the home farm here, it has now disappeared uh, and the dominant fish are now the native fish um, and it's because we believe that the habitat and this is this has been this is a, a fish survey it was undertaken by one of our foremost fish researchers um, we believe that the habitat quality has been rebuilt to the extent that now the uh, you know the predators against those fish are able to uh, have tipped the balance and so we're able to, uh, shortly we're going to be reintroducing some uh, extinct, locally extinct uh, frog species into the system. Uh, so it really is a good news story. There's another example where a structure, you know, structures were put in at strategic locations along the creek and now those structures effectively disappeared there. You know, that's, an, that's one way to determine if the system's working and rebuilding is if the, these structures should just disappear there. They become part of the natural system. And so now we're working with the neighbours, we're now going through the whole system. But one of the criticisms of the original natural sequence farming project at the home farm was that it wasn't really, really well benchmarked in the, in the beginning. There was not a lot of funds to do anything other than, um, you know, do the on-ground works themselves. But with this new um, watershed scale project, um, we're able to um, undertake some quite substantial scientific benchmarking and and this is part of the guarantee that we're able to provide to a number of the landholders that did have a fair bit of skepticism around this project thinking that yes well in fact we are pinching um, the water from downstream um, 
that if we were to um, properly scientifically benchmark and monitor this project, then they would be happy to be involved in the, in the, the catchment scale project. Um, so we've set up a, a lot of hydrological benchmarking, a lot of biodiversity, climatic benchmarking as well, where we're measuring the, you know, that, that whole diurnal water cycling effect as well, the, uh, the evaporation, the humidity levels, the, uh, the, the, the condensation at night, uh, that, that daily water cycle. Um, you know, it's argued by many regenerative farmers that uh, you, can, you can collect up to 100 millimetres more precipitation on an annual basis um, if you're managing your property property, if you, properly, if you're managing your green leaf surface area. So we're going we're gonna to measure that and determine if, empirically if that's actually the case. Um, we're also measuring agricultural outcomes uh, and, and social outcomes as well. Um, both within the community that are involved in the project more broadly and, and, and also with the stakeholders, the government stakeholders that we're working with as well. Um, I'll, just, I'll just race through this. I was just going to show you a bunch of, bunch of nice pictures looking at the, the shape of the landscape. When, when you're trying to understand, it's one of the key things, one of the... Uh, the, the the, the gifts that Peter Andrews has is being able to read the landscape. Um, mere mortals like me uh, need a lot of help from technology in, in some cases to read the landscape and so we're, we're fortunate that we've got high resolution digital elevation imagery over the, the catchment so we can read those natural patterns in the landscape and it helps gives us clues about how we can restruct this, reconstruct this landscape. You can see this uh, valley floor here. Um, all of these old runnels and so forth. You've got the erosion gully going right through the middle, but these are the old former flow paths of the, of the floodplain itself. And, uh, and you can see the alluvial fans coming out, out of the hills as well, which are, which are also important, important um, alluvial hydrological features. Um, it's not just about the valley floor, um, this approach. We're, we're taking a whole of landscape approach here. Uh, from the top of the, top of the hill, to the bottom of the hill, um, revegetating the tops of the hills, and uh, and revegetating the bottoms of the, of the hills, um, rebuilding the filter zone. This this is the filter zone at the bottom. This is the recharge zone at the at the top of the hill. And again, it's a biological process which has made and kept the tops of the hills fertile over so many years. And so this is just some examples of some of the work we're doing up the top of the hills contouring, revegetation, hill ponds, which are nutrient processing zones, which through the action of gravity are able to then spread um, nutrient rich water down slope during, during those pulse events. And, and then rebuilding the valley floor again. Uh, these structures, they take years in the planning and, uh, and a day to put in, um, but they have fairly instant results if we get them right. This is a structure which uh, that's a month after this structure was built um, it just uh, it was summertime and it just it just burst into life once we were able to slow down that water again and it's not a dam it still continues to trickle through and so a lot of education and uh, landholders involved in in the project uh, both in terms of the on-ground works and uh, and the educational programs that we're running there we go through Anthony. <laughs> Thank you.